the legal institution because you know even a supreme court is making mistake a panel of judges are making mistake uh, does that shake our belief in that institution we think supreme court is more powerful and they go by logic and uh, various uh, you know legal provisions so now we are finding that they have given something totally wrong which we think that it's totally wrong you given a wrong judgment so does it don't you think it shakes the faith and what is that to save us from this please as far as most people who have observed the proceedings are concerned it has really shaken their faith in the institution but since i practice before that institution i don't have the luxury of making that statement so i have to say that i continue to respect that institution but here's a simple answer there are five people who are sitting the same material is presented before five people one of them who is a lady thinks that there is enough material to come to the conclusion that the petition deserves to be dismissed so common sense must tell you that for any reasonable person to arrive at that conclusion there was enough material on record to say that this petition has no reason to exist before the supreme court and it needs to be dismissed and the practice needs to be protected so it can't be a situation where evidence was not led to arrive at that conclusion where enough ammunition was not placed before them to come to that conclusion despite that if four others have come to a different conclusion surely there is something else at play here which is to say people want to be seen as feminists people want to wear that as a badge of honor and people want to say we are the ones who liberated women and who facilitated their entry into the temple so if you choose to approach a certain case with that kind of a mentality or that kind of a sentiment according to me that does injustice to your mandate as someone who has judicial training because the very concept of judicial training that separates the black courts from let's say lay persons is that you keep your emotions aside and you simply focus on the evidence before you and and you apply it to the facts of the case and you apply the law as it stands as opposed to making leaps of imagination over 411 pages god knows why do you need to write such long judgments but when one person can I, can arrive at the conclusion four others can arrive at the conclusion but they choose not to do so i will assume that at least some of them genuinely believe that the practice is discriminative okay it's possible for two different people to have two different opinions on the same topic i don't have an issue with that but when the kind of statements or the kind of observations that have come in the judgment are read it makes you wonder what is going on evidence was led that evidence is not discussed instead we are discussing things about feminism we are talking stuff about misogyny that is pervading in this country and here's the interesting part you're talking of a state which is known for its matriarchy and matrilineal heritage kerala and you choose to impose that faith or you choose to accuse that particular state with what misogyny have you heard of female infanticide in kerala let's take the most popular sport of this country dowry deaths do you at least see that in kerala even that doesn't happen so i'm asking myself the simple question if you choose to impose your perception of where you live on a state where perhaps you have never been to and that too with respect to an institution which is dedicated to a brahmachari i'm asking myself what on earth did you read so i'll ask you the simple question you don't need to know the concept of naishtika brahmacharya okay let's forget it when you think of a brahmachari or a brahmacharini what is the first thing that comes to you as as a prerequisite distance from the opposite gender correct that's the basic concept what is so different from the practice of this temple from this basic concept if that is the common man's understanding of brahmacharya here is someone who is a celibate god who is a celibate deity why does he need to be celibate why do you need to wear a dress what is this question who are you to sit and decide what he is supposed to do and he is not supposed to do you don't have the training if that is the logic why do you need to have separate security screenings for men and women in the supreme court why do you need that parda do it openly no where does it say that man should actually check a man and woman should check a woman why are you doing this then everybody is equal let everyone check everybody i have a better question to ask after this judgment on section 377 even men shouldn't be checking men i'm sorry women shouldn't be checking women you don't know you don't know who is enjoying what no 
So my point is, if you, I, I want to use your own logic against you. So there are rules of how somebody is supposed to dress before the Supreme Court. There are qualifications that one must have to practice before the Supreme Court. But the temple must be free of all rules and qualifications. How fair is this? Did religion come first or the constitution come first? I am not saying this is a situation where the religion is, is at loggerheads with the constitution. The constitution itself recognizes a specific place for religion. According to me, the judgment flies in the face of the protection granted to religion by the constitution. Therefore, this violates the constitution is my basic uh, position. Which is why in the review petition, let's see what happens. It's coming up on the 13th of uh, November, day after tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Yes. Engineering student. Uh, sir, recently Barkadat released a video saying that victim, uh, sorry, Hindu victimhood is false. It's just a, a, like a fake story of a political agenda. Because uh, the main reason given for that is like, uh, like a various reasons, the main, the crux of the, uh, her story was Hindu are in majority in this country. So nothing can happen to them because they have the numbers, they have the uh, power to tilt the vote in their favor. And also anyone who tries to argue against it is also banned as Savarna, entitled Brahmin and other such uh, things. Uh, like the same, the, the same thing was applied in USA and look what we got now. We got Trump. The reactionary element to the social justice warrior is nothing but Trump. The white supremacy and other reactionary elements. And also this system is propagated by ecosystem in academia. Because anything you do, because not everyone can have such profound uh, nuances. So my question is how to uh, overcome this, sir? How to fight this, this entitlement or the victimhood? When will this victimhood go, sir? I'll give you a simple example, a simple answer. One minute, sir. Extension of this question. Okay, in this constitution, I am Raghu from Pragna Bharti, by the way. Uh, the constitution we have 24 to 35, Article 24 to 31, it, which protects the minority rights. Okay, minority rights. But we do not have anything like majority rights. It only says the constitution only says that you know they can anyway influence the franchisee, so they don't need to have a separate uh, 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 minor majority rights. So are we fighting the constitution? Are we fighting the state? Okay, and uh, in this uh, Hindu fragmented society, can we really do this? Okay, this I got one. this. Okay. So first, I'll answer your question. So, according to her, if you're in a majority, you can't be a victim. Correct? So, the converse of that statement is, if you're in a minority, you can never be the aggressor. You'll always have to be the victim. Correct? Okay. Are Brahmins in a majority or minority? Minority. So, if Brahmins are in a minority, they could have never dictated terms to others. Is that the logic? Shall we agree with that? Anybody who is less in number and does not enjoy numerical superiority is never in a position of dominance, correct? That's the assumption. Brahmins were never in a majority. Why do you keep blaming Brahmins? Why do you keep bashing Brahmins all the time if according to you, people who are in minority can never dominate others? It is not a question of numbers. What applies to Brahmins must also apply to others? Or is the logic different? If the logic is different, then it is convenience. Correct? I won't call it logic then. Correct? What was the number of Britishers when they left this country? Any guess? There were barely a few lakhs. What was the population of this country when those uh, people left this country? 30 crores. Correct? Even today, Brit uh, Britain does not have that kind of population. We are very good at breeding. Right? Nobody has been able to beat us so far. It's not 1.25 billion as uh, Modi ji says. From Sabha uh, Sokarov, we have now gone to 1.4 billion in fact. So on Doordarshan, when you see that uh, thing which has the population clock, it's like a time bomb, it's ticking. So the point is, I'm trying to say that if that is the logic, no people who are small in number can ever be accused of dominating others. Can you do this in South Africa then? It was a white minority. What about Zimbabwe? It was a white minority. Yes or no? There are five fingers and there is one fist. Which is stronger? The finger or the fist? That's the answer. You may be five fingers, but there is one fist. 
Is it difficult for a fist to break each finger? When the fingers don't come together? Is it a fair contest between a finger and a fist or a fist versus fist? That's the logic. Why do you even bring up that lady? She's irrelevant. Forget her. She's lost her relevance. She's lost her relevance. Here's her claim to fame. She has blood of soldiers on her hands. Both during Kargil and 2611. She's the last person who should speak about the country. It is her articles which form the basis of the Sabarimala petition. You ask her what is the nature of the basis of the tradition, she won't know anything. Don't bring her. She is an ignorant person who has a certain agenda. As simple as that. You should know who you can argue with and who you can convince. These are not people who can be convinced. They understand only one language. Which is that either you are in power or you are out of power. As simple as that. That is the only language they understand. That is precisely the problem with Mr. Modi. Although I have certain problems with him for not doing anything for us. Either as it may. These people. So here is the thing. If there is a fence sitter who is asking a genuine question. Who is not able to make up his mind. It makes sense to try and place a position before that person. But nobody can convince me today. I can't convince anyone who has already formed his opinions. So, I don't think you should think of persuading her or convincing her. You should only find ways of countering her. Or people like her or the ideology she represents. Individuals at the end of the day will come and go. What you should go after is the broad ideology which is at the heart of the problem. As long as you fixate on individuals, you'll obsess with them and you'll lose sight of the actual issue. So coming to your question, sir. See, the problem is, there are two ways of doing it. And as a lawyer, I have to say this. You give a document, there will be multiple ways of interpreting it. The provisions you are referring to are Articles 26 to 30. It should be only Articles 28 to 30, not even 26 to 30. Because the specific treatment of minorities, especially their educational institutions, come in Articles 28 to 30. It is only their educational institutions which cannot be interfered with by the state. But the interesting part is, the term minority is not defined in the constitution. Okay? And nowhere does it say that it shall be only Muslims or Christians or anybody else who will be treated as minorities because it refers to both linguistic minorities as well as religious minorities. So if I were to start a Sanskrit school run by people who speak only Sanskrit, then I would be entitled to be treated as a minority institution, a linguistic minority institution. Okay? The problem is the manner in which you choose to interpret those provisions and therefore it becomes an issue with the judgments of the court and its take of these, of these provisions. Now there is a sudden claim by a lot of people asking for amendment of these constitutional provisions. Articles 28 to 30 saying that they are against uh, majority. I don't agree with them to some extent which is to say Treat Hinduism as an agglomeration of multiple minorities, which is the way it is. The word for denomination in Hinduism is Sampradaya. If you look at the Hindi translation of the constitution, religious denomination is translated to Sampradaya. So it is very well possible for multiple schools of thought within the Hindu fold to claim status as minorities. But here is where the real problem lies. There was a legislation that was brought under Sonia Gandhi. I won't call it under Manmohan Singh. It was under Sonia Gandhi. Which is the National Commission for Minority Educational Institutions. The NCMIE Act. No non, oh sorry, no Hindu can ever be a member of that commission. So here is a situation where you have codified and you have ensured that no Hindu institution which is of a minority character legitimately in the con under the constitution can get the status of a minority institution because there is no Hindu minority member sitting there. You know of this in a recent instance where the Supreme Court effectively rejected the Hindu minority status in states where they are really in a minority. In Kashmir they don't exist. Practically they don't exist. Even when they were kicked out they were only about 6, uh, six lakhs. Less, I, mean, close, I mean less than a million. They were not even a million. And today you only have a few hundred thousands, not more than that. Even not, in, not even a few hundred thousands. 
even their claim for treatment as a minority has been rejected. The problem is not with the document, the problem is with the human mind which chooses to interpret it in a certain way, which has a certain ideological bias. And that is precisely the reason why I say that the more the common Hindu starts standing up for her rights or his rights in that order, that is when you will start seeing a shift. The Allahabad High Court gave a judgment with respect to Ram Janabhumi in 2010. A High Court of the country has given a judgment. Has it stopped anyone who is lost in that particular case from challenging and criticizing the judgment? No, it is not. Mr. Modi was given a clean shit with respect to 2002 by the Supreme Court after the special investigation team said he was not responsible for the riots and he was not responsible for anything. Has it stopped any of these people from criticizing Modi after the Supreme Court has ex effectively given him a clean shit? That's it. Free speech is available before the judgment, during the judgment and after the judgment. Next please. Sir, sir, sir. Am I audible sir? Yes please. Namaskaram. My name is Rahul. Uh, I'm running a digital agency in Hyderabad. So I have a bigger concern, sir. With all due respect for advocates and uh, courts in this country, I just wanted to know, I just want to know if the impeachment of a chief justice or a justice could happen through an electoral process. Could that be possible? Because I'm, we know that legislative and executive body cannot uh, interfere in matters of judiciary. But at the end of the day, if judicial process itself is being devoid of logic, would that be possible to have an electoral process? Because I personally believe the case of Sabrimala, comprehensively every party supported the cause and uh, every party supported the Supreme Court. But it was only the devotees of Sabrimala and the Hindus who actually understood that their culture and their traditions are being attacked and they are the ones who stood up for it and everyone else later took advantage of it. So this would actually uh, convey a bigger meaning than whatever we are seeing currently. It is the innate Indic sense, it is the innate Hindu sense which is indebt and it is innate in us is doing this. So and hence I would believe that if ever there is any body which is governing the, the whole process or even devoid of any other uh, logic, there will there be a process where there can be an election process? So, unfortunately... And one more, sorry for that. Yes, please, yes, please. So this is one. And secondly, um, I beg to differ on one aspect which you were talking about. So we are, we are talking about the below poverty line and we are talking about the lower middle class people. But I personally believe the problem in this country is not because of the illiterates, but it's because of the literates and the educated people. Correct. Agreed. The educated people, I mean, when I say educated people, I'm basically talking about the people who can tweak things, who might not know about the sense. Say, for example, the, fir the, the part which you were talking about, Mahalaya Paksha. Mahalaya Paksha actually ended in like October 8th or 10th, and there is a period of another month for that. This is being misinformed. I mean, every single um, aspect, what we, are, what we are talking about, is not being completely, comprehensively conveyed to the people. Say, for example, if you take... Um, Mantra Pushpam while doing the puja process. Not everyone knows that it's an embodiment of water within our lives. But if you talk about any other religion, it is, it is very, uh, you know, it is dumbed down to each and every individual. So there is, there is Christianity for dummies. There is Buddhism for dummies. There is Muslims for, uh, uh, Quran for dummies. But there is nothing which would actually convey in our language, the day-to-day the -day language which we speak in indicness. Agreed. So that is one problem which we are facing. So if we are talking about uh, Indic Renaissance or something which is similar to that, I'm pretty sure we are, as a system, attacked even before. Adi Shankaracharya united us again. So there are a there are lot of attacks on us and we are going through attacks. But if you think uh, the efforts are not being happening, it, they are happening. They are happening but it is individual. The, the power systems are not being placed in a proper way. So is there any way, the first question, uh, election Understood. process and second is there any way to empower the whole system and bring it into a synergy and make this happen because I would believe whatever you spoke today if at all it is conveyed to at least our lakh people there will be a change in five lakh Correct. but here it is only unfortunately not even 200 people of us Agreed. I think it should be within at least 2000 people attending to this conference right. so can you just address that thank you so just to answer that first question 
So the one thing that I have been speaking about on a regular basis is the overreach of the judiciary. So here's the thing. You don't play any role in the appointment of any judge in this country, correct? You have no say. So that means their appointment is not through election, it is plain and simple appointment. And this is even at the highest level possible. So the question that we should perhaps ask ourselves is, is a completely unaccountable judiciary antithetical to the concept of a democracy? If any arm of the state which can wield such power over the people, can it remain free from criticism by the people and can it remain free from being held to account by the people? If that is the case, can such an institution have a place in a democracy? That's the basic question. It is precisely for this reason that the Judicial Accountability Bill and the NJAC was proposed so that elected members have some say. Even the president is elected by the people whom you have elected. At the very least, the elected members have a say. But if your elected members don't even have a say in the appointment of the members of the judiciary, what do you do then? In theory, strictly in theory, an independent judiciary was conceived of only for one reason. If the government chooses to overstep its boundaries, goes beyond its mandate and clamps down on fundamental rights, then there must be at least one institutional safeguard, which is the judiciary, which gives the pushback necessary. But during emergency, we saw that theory completely failing. So as far as I am concerned, the problem lies in uh, an institutional safeguard which is absent in holding them to account. The, if, the, if an institution believes that the manner in which I exist is perfect and there is absolutely no room for or need for reform, then that institution certainly does not have the right to pontificate reform to anybody else. At the very least. You can't say this is the best I can be and that I don't need any kind of intervention from outside because I wish to preserve my independence. Why can't a religious institution take the same position? Your position is derived from the constitution which is the will of the people. The position of the temple is derived from the belief of the people. So why can't the temple equally take that position that we will not accept any judicial intervention in the name of reform? The problem is the executive will not go beyond a certain point because they too are wary of repercussions from the judiciary. It is for the common people to start doing this. Private initiatives which actually say that it is time that at the very least a referendum is conducted to ask the people whether they want reform in the judicial appointment or not. Here is the interesting part. Indian courts are so fond of citing English judgments in, the, in their judgments. English judges are appointed through a judicial appointments committee. But Indian judges are not open to it or at least Indian judiciary is not open to it. Why is that? So, English judges don't see a threat to their independence merely because elected members have a say in their appointment, but only Indian judiciary thinks that it is under threat. So, when that institution goes well beyond its mandate and has resulted in such chaos, especially when it comes to Sabrimala, that entire state is on the boil because of a judgment. That is the fact. For several centuries, a practice which has not incited any kind of passion Today is the subject of intense debate. Women are out on the streets. Those people whose rights you, will, you were hoping to protect are the very people who are offended by the judgment. They are out on the streets. So I would ideally want some kind of a say where at least elected representatives have a say in this. Coming to the second question. So one of my own uh, faults or something that I have tried to work on over the years is that I can't seem to express myself better than in any other language other than in English, which I think is a serious problem. I don't think of it as a badge of honor. I don't think it's a compliment at all. 
being able to speak in english is one thing but being able to speak only in english is problem is certainly a problem so i can speak in any other language in day to day conversation but when it comes to the stage or when it comes to public speaking at best perhaps i can switch to hindi so the idea is that perhaps you need a three tier education where english is certainly taught but should it be the medium of instruction is a question it's a longer debate it's a bigger debate now as far as the specific question that you have asked i have to disagree with you only on one count there are any number of works which have been written by people to communicate the significance of the rituals that you perform based on my own limited knowledge i know for a fact that there are enough number of works so here's how it it, it actually happens you have adi shankaracharya whose level of erudition is so high that it's difficult for you to reach out to him but there are several mid level scholars and subsequent commentators who have translated who have analyzed their work for a lay person to understand bhakti movement as far as i am concerned was a move to ensure that this esoteric knowledge reaches out to the masses so that they are not completely connected from the core or sorry disconnected from the core so that is one option but the most important option is this and this is something that i understood from the history of israel israel is effectively a country of immigrants they have come from poland they have come from germany they have come from russia they have come from baghdad they have come from tunisia they have come from all over the world because for 2000 years they were effectively outside the country or outside that land which they call eretz israel so when they come back how do they talk to each other it's difficult There is no such thing as an Israeli cuisine. You have an Ethiopian cuisine. You have other cuisines. Most of their cuisines are the cuisines that they brought with them. They decided that there will be at least one language which will bind all of us. That is Hebrew. If you go through the parliamentary debates, there was a concrete suggestion made that there must be a three-tier system, where Sanskrit, the local language, and English. must be taught to members of each state unfortunately it is bound to hurt our notions of secularism and therefore sanskrit was completely rejected as a consequence it is relegated to the margins today most people don't understand it and it is limited only to the priestly community if 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 we had to work out a solution and that's something that's being discussed is school curriculum has effectively been made useless by coaching centers correct why can't you have coaching centers which discuss our history which discuss our language most people go to schools only for the purposes of a normal education but what they do is in the coaching center i'm sure every hyderabadi who's aspired for an iit degree has done this after quota or at least at par with quota this is one place that looks down upon school education and looks up to coaching education right so if that can happen to these topics why can't it happen to something else the problem is these topics or the this education gives has a specific incentive there is an economic incentive attached to it at the end of it you have a certain degree you have a certain career prospect you don't see a value in other kinds of education so we are producing glorified workers who have utilitarian skills with no sense of identity that is where the problem is so the hope is that you have at least a couple of these institutions which which impart training in all of this but that's also happening the problem is it needs to be scaled up that is why you're talking of synergy it needs to be scaled up the level of the efforts is not at at the same pace at which deracination is happening the pace is extremely different that's a question for the society to ask not if, i mean at least i can't answer every question i can't take up every issue maybe you take up the issue who knows this will be the last question please yeah uh my my name is vijay raina i am from kashmir so unfortunately i had to come out of the valley because of pro islamic terrorism in 1990s so i am living in hyderabad for last 15 years uh, i am working as a pharmaceutical scientist in a local multinational company uh, us based multinational company so my question is there are two questions if you can excuse me for second question also Uh, the question number one is related to the control of religious shrines with respect to uh, Mata Vaishno Devi Shrine Board, and also second question is related to the secularism. 
the first question is like this. Uh, so as an individual, when I find the mismanagement and the poor management uh, done by Karan Singh's family with respect to the shrine, right. Mata Vaishno Devi shrine. So right. uh, when Jack Mohan became the governor of JNK in 1986, so he mentioned in his book, My Frozen Turbulence in Kashmir, that it was my soul depressing yatra when he went there. So he saw many things which ordinarily temple uh, management would not take care of. So when he came back and he, he mentions in his book like this that I requested uh, Ma to give me one chance at least to make things look better for people who come as dev devotees to this shrine. Uh, so it happened so naturally so he became second time governor in 1986 and the first thing he did is he dissolved the board and Karan Singh made an appeal in the high court. Actually there was some violence also which was propagated by the locals, uh, local Rajputs and the temple bearers and all. But he never allowed violence to happen. He uh, gave orders to the CRPF and BSF that I don't want anybody to uh, in infringe in uh, this whole matter. Uh, then uh, after six months, when uh, Karan Singh himself went there and saw the development, because he built all the roads, uh, 12 kilometer road is there and then sodium vapor lamps, toilets, washrooms, everything. Oh, so Karan Singh had to actually apologize to him and withdraw the uh, court that uh, application, what he uh, had put in the court to... What's your question? Sir? Yeah, question is, uh, as a citizen, on one hand I am seeing the temple management, poor, temple's poor management and mismanagement. If government takes care, then I am happy actually to see the progress. How do I uh, distinguish between the two in that kind of Good a situation? Question. Okay. So, uh, here's the answer to this. If you look at any of these legislations, you split them into three baskets, the good, the bad and the ugly. Okay. Our fight against these legislations is against the baskets which have the bad and the ugly. When there is mismanagement of an institution where public money is at play, I do believe that the state must have some kind of a say in setting the wrong right and in ensuring that things come back on the right track. I don't have a problem with it. But does it require you to play the role of a big brother who is constantly in that institution? That's where the distinction lies. So there are three words that I will use and you tell me what idea it conveys. Takeover, regulation, restriction. Which according to you is the extreme form of control? Takeover. The other two basically limit themselves to limited intervention. That is the idea. So if you look at the constitution, and I am giving you a clear legal answer, it requires and it envisages that the state shall only play a limited role in ensuring that there is no mismanagement. So for instance, the restructuring of a company happens if a company of a public limited company is mismanaged. It is possible for the government to appoint somebody Previously it was the official liquidator during the winding up process and you have people who are appointed to take over the management for a limited period. But after that the government, the company is given back to the people who originally promoted the company and were the shareholders of the company. That is more or less the same structure that is envisaged by the constitution which is to say assume that there is a temple which has a board and trustees from the community. The government can pass a legislation which requires these board members and the trustees to maintain accounts in a certain format, in a certain manner and has the right to examine those accounts and conduct an audit. Whenever and wherever it sees a problem with the management of the funds of the institution, it can initiate corrective mechanisms. But what is happening today is that in the name of good management, the appointment of the members also is in the hands of the government. The running of the institution is also in the hands of the government. The manner in which the resources will be used is also dictated by the government. The time at which a certain archana or a certain practice or a puja will be conducted is also decided by the government. So on one hand you have a complete detachment of the state and the other hand you have complete entrenchment of the state. I am simply advocating the middle path. The state must have a limited say to do two things. That there is no caste based discrimination in a temple. The traditions of the temple must not be violated. 
Therefore, if it has a denominational identity, then it must be the denomination that continues to control the temple. And where there is no basis for practicing discrimination, then discrimination on the basis of gender must not be allowed. But when it is based on a certain tradition, where it is based on a certain belief, which is central to the identity of the temple, the state should not have any say at all. And where they see corruption, it is possible for the state to conduct a random audit and initiate corrective mechanisms. I am completely with all of this. All of this should result only in a three-page legislation, not 250 sections, 300 sections, which envisage the appointment of executive officer in every state. In Tamil Nadu, in every temple, an executive officer has been appointed without any order being passed to the effect that there is mismanagement of, of the funds of the temple. What is the basic principle that you expect from the state? If the state were to enter your house, can it do so without a warrant? Can it do so without a warrant? It cannot. A warrant requires the state to, ex to explain the reasons why it believes it needs to enter your house. Correct? At the very least, it must say that it suspects you of something and therefore it needs to enter. In 38,000 institutions, there is no order passed by the state government of Tamil Nadu justifying the appointment of an executive officer in the temple trust. How do you justify this? This is the extreme. And what is the consequence? From 1959, 47,000 acres of land have been alienated by the state officials which belong to the temple without any documents. 47,000 acres of prime property. There is encroachment, no litigation is initiated to evict the encroachers. Rents are, or rather land is given at rents which are sub-market prices and they don't even recover that money. If that money were to be collected, people who are dependent on the temple, and it's not just the Brahmins, there are several communities who are dependent on the temple's ecosystem. Even they will benefit. Is it not possible for them to establish schools and hospitals for the people who are dependent on the temple? They don't earn enough to go to private hospitals. So, I'm completely with you that as a member of the public, you would want to ensure that there is a safeguard to prevent mismanagement and the state must have some say. But state must have say only with respect to rectifying mismanagement, but not over complete management. That's my position. You mentioned about the regulations, so I would also uh, give my thought on that. Like uh, all the temples, because we have different uh, states and all, we have our own uh, customs and rituals. Uh, so regulations should actually be handled by the community. Regulation, Correct. there should be a written regulations what to do, what not to do, so Correct. that government don't have any uh, any opinion on that. They can only do an audit or it can be internal audit as well as external Just audit. But regulations should be maintained by the community Correct. itself. Correct. If you look at the Tamil Nadu Act, the one good thing that we certainly don't want to interfere with is it prescribes the composition of the temple trust. Men, women, Dalits. All three of them are given a position in that particular community composition, in that particular trust composition. We completely support it. Because only then all communities will feel part of the particular institution. We are not attacking any of those aspects. We are going only after those aspects where the state has unbridled powers to interfere with the management and the use of resources. Here's how it operates. When the temple draws a budget for the year, until the executive officer signs off and approves of that budget, they cannot spend the money. It's a license permit, Raj. Yeah. 